Just washing my hands. Uh, I'm Catherine Bigman. Janet Carlisle referred me. Oh, yes. Uh, you're being a very delight in a box. Yes. Yes, that's me. <laughs> Should I lay down? Oh, no, no, no. We don't, we don't do that anymore. Just, just have a seat. And uh, let, let me uh, tell you a, a bit about our, our billing. I, um, I charge $5 for the, for the first five minutes. And, and then absolutely nothing after that. How, how, how does that sound? That sounds great. <laughs> Too good to be true, as a matter of fact. <laughs> well, I can I can almost guarantee you that that our session won't last the full uh, the full five minutes. Now um, <laughs> we don't do any insurance billing, so you would either have to pay in in cash or by check. <clears throat> wow. Okay. And uh, and I I don't make change. <laughs> All right. <laughs> and go. <laughs> go. Well, tell what? me, tell me about the problem that you wish to address. Oh, okay. Uh, well, I have this fear of being buried alive in a box. <laughs> I just, I start thinking about being buried alive, and I begin to panic. Has, has, has anyone ever, ever tried to, to bury you alive in a box? No. No, but truly thinking about it does make my life horrible. I mean, I can't go through tunnels or be in an elevator or in a house, anything boxy. <laughs> so what, what you're saying is you're, uh, you're claustrophobic. Uh, yes. Yes, that's it. <laughs> All right. Well, uh, let's go, Catherine. I'm... Uh, I'm going to uh, say two words to you right now. I, I want you to listen to them very, very carefully. Then I want you to take them out of the office with you and incorporate them in, into your life. Well, shall I uh, write them down? Well, it, if it makes you comfortable, it's just two words. Most, we find most people can, uh, can remember them. <laughs> okay. You ready? Yes. Okay, here, you're there. Stop it! <laughs> Stop it? Yes, S-T-O-P, new word, I-T. So, what are you saying? <laughs> you, you know, it's funny. I, I, I say two simple words, and I cannot tell you the amount of people who say exactly the same thing you're saying. I mean, this, you know, this is not Yiddish, Catherine. This is English. Stop it. So, I should just stop it. There you go. I mean, you... you, you you don't want to go through life being scared of being buried alive in a box, do you? I mean, that sounds, sounds frightening. <laughs> yes. Then stop it! I, I can't. I mean, it's been with me no, since no, childhood. No, no, no. No, we, 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 we don't go there. Just, just stop. <laughs> so I should just stop being afraid of being buried alive in a box. You got it. Good go. My name is uh, Jamie Mills. I'm one of the pastors here at Suburban, and 
Um, this is our third week uh, going through a sermon series that we're calling Epic Fail. And it's a sermon series that's looking at the 300-year period that we go through in the book of Judges. And so before we get like going too far in that, I, I don't know if you guys can remember the first video, the guy who ran the mountain bike into the fence. I've actually seen Jesse, our college pastor, do that very thing. It was pretty awesome. But my wife said that if the Jesse was the one on the mountain bike, I was the one on the slip and slide. And that made me feel, <laughs> that made me feel weird. 300 year period that's covered by the book of Judges, and it really can be summed up. It's something that we've shared here before, but the book of Judges really can be summed up by what's the very last verse in the book of Judges. It's Judges uh, 21, 25, and this is what it says. In those days, Israel had no king, and all of the people did whatever seemed right in their own eyes. And in Judges, we, we see this downward spiral that things uh, were going from bad to worse, which is kind of a stinky thing as a preacher because like, it's getting depressing and it's going to get worse before it gets better. So next week, hold on, it gets worse. But that's Mike's job. So uh, you can pray for Mike as he tackles that one. But actually, the lessons that we learn in the book of Judges are really, really important. We can go all the way back. I love it when scripture does this, when, we, when we're able to do this. But we can go all the way back to Genesis chapter 12, verse 3. And we can read about promises that God made to Abraham. He promised Abraham that through his lineage that, that he would become a great nation and that it would be a blessing to all people. And so when we fast forward all the way to the time period of Judges, what we're studying today, we can see again that God is doing exactly what he said he would do. The people of Israel are settling in to the promised land, the land that God told them about, that God promised all the way back with Abraham. It's, it's finally happening. And if there was ever a time that you would think, at least I would think anyway, that you would see God's people begin to experience his presence and, and what it means to kind of just live that out before the Lord, you would think that it would be as they were taking over this new land. But what we find is that's not what's happening. It's almost like you can hear God say, S-T-O-P, new word, IT, stop it, because Israel would wander away again and again and again. They totally lost track of the role that God was to play in their life. They lost sight of who he is and the provision, uh, his direction, his, his purpose, and his plan for them. And, and it's interesting in Judges because you never see like an outright rejection of God. It's more like an aimless meandering away from him. And by the time we get to the, the part of the story that we're going to look at today, what you realize is, is the people of Israel, God's people, and the things that were supposed to d distinguish them from the rest of the, of, of the people, there just really isn't anything left of that. There's nothing that's distinguishing God's people from any other people on earth. And Samson's story, that's who we're going to be talking about today, Samson's story starts just like this. This is Judges 13.1. Before we go, I'm going to say this. Samson is cut from Judges 13 all the way through the end of Judges 16. We're not going to read all that verbatim, so we're going to paraphrase some of that. But Judges, uh, Samson's story in Judges 13.1 starts just like this. It says, Again, the Israelites did evil in the, in the Lord's sight, and so the Lord handed them over to the Philistines, who oppressed them for 40 years. And so this is part of the downward spiral. This is part of the cycle. It happened over and over, and it's happening again. Israel walked away from God. They abandoned him. They forgot about him. And what we see is that even in the midst of their unfaithfulness, even in the midst of Israel's unfaithfulness, God is there. And as uncomfortable as it might make us feel, God was allowing, or maybe even orchestrating, difficult situations that would cause Israel to realize that they were outside of what God wanted for them. They were outside of where they belonged. And as we look at Judges, it, 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 I think it would be a pretty big mistake for us uh, to not talk about one of the major things that we see there. Throughout the book, we definitely see it in Samson's story too. But sin was having a dramatic impact on the nation of Israel and on the people living inside it. Sin was having a dramatic impact on the nation of Israel and on the people living inside of it. And, and Israel continued to do evil in the Lord's sight. They continued to, uh, and God continued to put Israel in situations where they would feel it and cry out and come back to him. But when we look at Samson's story, we see something that we haven't seen before. And I think it's pretty important. 
For the first time, as God was giving the people of Israel a judge, as someone who would deliver them, Israel does not cry out to God. In captivity, Israel does not cry out to God for the first time. And I don't know why. Like, why, why, why would Israel, in captivity, when they, when they had done that so many times before, why did they stop crying out to God? Were they just comfortable in captivity? Did they simply not care anymore? Were they placing their hope in something else? I don't know. And I realize what, what I'm going to talk about next is really not very fun or, or popular, um, and I get it. It's not my favorite thing to preach on either. So we can meet there and feel good about that. But sometimes I wonder if we have misunderstandings about sin. And I think it's worth looking at. I mean, exactly what is sin? What does it do in our life? What do we do with it once we kind of realize that it's there? And in my opinion, people will probably disagree with this, but in my opinion, sin is really not all that easy to define. I think it goes beyond a list of things that we shouldn't do. In fact, James 4.17 tells us that, that sin can even be those things that we know that we should do but that we don't do. Things like loving well. Things like forgiving. Things like serving and things like living in humility. Sin is an archery term. It means to miss the mark. To be off target. And one of the definitions that I found that really spoke to me as I was studying for this was sin means to be outside of the sweet spot. Sin isn't about what we do or don't do as much as it is about a loving God who wants us to experience everything that he intends for us. And God doesn't want sin to be a part of our life because he knows the impact it will have on us and on those around us. And there's a couple of passages I want to talk about real quick that I think help us understand a, a sin a little bit, which is one is Romans 3.23 that says that everyone has sinned and everybody falls short. Sin is everyone's issue. It's not my favorite truth, but nonetheless, every single person I've ever met in my entire life struggles with sin and everyone inside the room that's here today struggles with sin. It's everybody's issue. So struggling with sin does not make you a freak somehow, does not make you weird. It's everybody's issue. We all struggle with sin. It's part of the human condition. Romans 6.23 says that the wages of sin is death. That sin has a destructive and deadly quality. And we can clearly see that in the book of Judges. Like if you want to start and read all the way through the book of Judges, by the time that you get to Samson, we don't even need to talk about Samson, although it gets much worse with Samson. And then study it beyond Samson, it gets much worse again. But we see it clearly that sin has a damaging and deadly effect in the book of Judges. And I think that we're in denial if we think that our lives are somehow immune to sin or its effects. In fact, if we learn anything from the book of Judges, maybe this would be it. That sin keeps us from experiencing all that God has for us, and that it's dangerous if our gauge for morality comes down to what seems right in our own eyes. By a show of hands, how many of you guys are totally comfortable with the people sitting next to you living out whatever seems right in their, whole, in their own eyes? Right? Like, that's uncomfortable for me. And, and it's funny, like, as I think about that, like, I'm kind of comfortable with my own gauge, right? But I'm very not comfortable with all of yours. And I, I don't think I'm alone in that, right? I mean, and that, the only thing that really tells me is maybe I'm a little bit overconfident in my own gauge, right? That's what I learned there. So what do we do about sin in our life? The Bible tells us to repent, which is a really churchy word that really means a couple of things, or two that I'm going to point out today. To me, repentance has to do with a, a godly sorrow over sin in our lives, a brokenness as we come before the Lord, willing to call sin what it is. Basically acknowledging that we have sin and, and being broken about that before the Lord. That's part of what repentance is. The other part of what repentance is that I want to share about today is it, it means a change in direction. Repentance does not mean that we simply stop doing something, but it means that we allow God's truth to change the way that we think. Repentance implies the desire to honor God in our lives and the desire to experience all that he has for us. Another important thing about repentance to me is that it's not a one and done thing, right? Repentance is not something that we just kind of do once and then leave it there and walk away, but repentance is something as, as we do life with God and seek to honor God in our life that we come back to often. And maybe it is a coincidence, right? Maybe. Maybe it is a coincidence that that when God tells me to be about better things, when it comes to areas like dishonesty and, and cheating and gossip and pride and greed and lust and addiction and self, selfishness, I mean, maybe it is a coincidence.
Or maybe it's not. I mean, maybe all, all those things that God tells us not to be about, the reason why he says that is not simply because he's God and he says no, but it's because he loves you and he knows that sin is corrosive. He knows that the sin is damaging, that those things really do have a negative impact on my life, on my marriage, on my kids, on my character, on my relationships. Maybe that's really what sin is more about than just a list of do's and don'ts. About a loving God who wants you to live in the sweet spot in a relationship with him. I mean, could it be? Could it be that the God who created everything, the God that opens our eyes, that causes our heart to beat, the God who sustains everything as as we sit here even now, I mean, could it be that that he has a a better vantage point, a better idea of what is right and good and true, that what seems right in his eyes might be more trustworthy and more important than what seems right in our own? And I think for some people, like maybe a lot of people, this could be one of the harder issues when it comes to dealing with sin. Acknowledging that in Christ, there is a better way than your way. I'm going to read the, the first 14 verses out of Judges chapter 13, and I'm going to be reading it out of the New Living Translation. Um, and I might, I might cut it off a little bit short. We'll see. But this is what it says. Again, the Israelites did evil in the Lord's sight, so the Lord handed them over to the Philistines who oppressed them for 40 years. In those days, a man named Manoah from the tribe of Dan lived in the town of Zorah. His wife was unable to become pregnant, and they had no children. And the angel of the Lord appeared to Manoah's wife and said, "Everything, or even though you, you have been unable to have children, you will soon become pregnant and give birth to a son, so be careful. You must not drink wine or any other alcoholic drink, nor eat any forbidden food. You will become pregnant and give birth to a son, and his hair must never be cut, for he will be dedicated to God as a Nazarite from birth. He will, be given, uh, he will begin to rescue Israel from the Philistines. And the woman ran back and told her husband, A man of God appeared to me. He looked like one of God's angels, terrifying to see. I didn't ask where he was from, and he didn't tell me his name. But he told me, You will become pregnant, and you will give birth to a son, and you must not drink wine or, or any other alcoholic drink or eat any forbidden food, for your son will be dedicated to God as a Nazarite from the moment of his birth until the moment of his death, to the day of his death. And then Manoah prayed to the Lord, Lord, please let, me, please let this man of God come back to us again and give us more instructions about, who this, about, this, about this son who is to be born. And God answered Manoah's prayer, and the angel of the Lord appeared to him once again to his wife, and he was sitting in the field, but her husband Manoah was not with her. And so she quickly ran out, told her husband, the man who appeared to me the other day is here again. And Manoah ran back with his wife and asked, are you the man that spoke to my wife the other day? Yes, she replied, I am. Manoah asked him, when your words become true, what kind of rules should govern this boy's life and work? And the angel replied, be sure to follow your wife, be sure your wife follows the instructions I gave her. She must not eat grapes or raisins, drink wine or any other alcoholic drink or any forbidden food. And so that's how Samson's story starts. And right away we see quite a a bit of uniqueness when it comes to him when you compare him to the other judges. One is, um, is that Samson is really the only judge that was foretold. We learn about Samson before Samson was born. His birth announcement was kind of right up there with Isaac and with John the Baptist. I mean, the people who played a central role in God's story. And and Samson's kind of birth announcement was very similar. We find out about Samson before he was ever born. His birth was somewhat miraculous, right? His wife was, or his mom was unable to have have a child. And all of a sudden, she's going to become pregnant. We read that Samson was called to have a special relationship with God. And we also read that he was called uh, for a special purpose, and so when you look at these things, those, those four things that we just talked about, you consider everything that was involved with Samson's birth, it sure seems like everything's about to turn around for Israel. I mean, I so anyway. I mean, the next is one that God thought so far in advance about, I mean, we know by now, but what I would have so far that like, you know, that he was people, he was kind of, the kind of the circumstances around his birth. I mean, if there was ever time in judges to, to kind of look at a leader ahead of time and point to them and think that they were going to be brilliant leaders, that we were going to see some real good things begin to happen you'd have to look at Samson's story from the beginning and think this would be the guy. Yeah, but no. 
Unfortunately, we learn far more about what not to do from Samson than what to do. And so we talked about how Samson was called into this special relationship with God. And in the New Living Translation, what it says is that he was going to be a Nazarite. Well, that was really a vow. There was a thing called a Nazarite vow. And we learned a couple of things about it in the passage that we just looked at. We learned some of the outward expectations of someone that was kind of underneath the Nazarite vow. And so basically what it, what it was saying in the passage that we read was that they couldn't cut their hair, they were not supposed to drink, and they weren't supposed to touch dead stuff. So that was the outward kind of happenings of what the Nazarite vow was. But if you uh, turn to number six, I think it's like the first 20 verses or so in number six, there's actually a bigger explanation of what the Nazarite vow was. And what we see is that the Nazarite vow was really about separation and consecration. It was a season, or like in Samson's case, a, a lifetime that was set aside and set apart to step back and really seek and serve God completely. Samson was dedicated to seeking and serving God from even before he was born. He had a special relationship with God. He was called to a special relationship with God. And the other thing that we see is that Samson was called uh, to a special purpose. Verse 5 says that he would begin to, deliver God, begin to deliver God's people from the Philistines. And I don't know if you hear it, but the first thing that sticks out to me when I hear that phrase is the word begin. He would begin to deliver God's people. He wouldn't finish what he started. He would begin to deliver God's people. All the promise that we see in Samson and all the things that are involved with this story, he wouldn't finish the job, which I think is interesting. And as you read uh, Samson's story, what you realize is that along with the vow and along with this special relationship and special purpose that he was called to have, Samson was in this crazy, unhuman strength. And it's interesting because, you know, Samson really did do some pretty amazing things. Like, you know, just to mention a couple of them, it says that he killed a lion with his bare hands, that he killed 30 Philistines at one time, that he cut 300 foxes and torched the crops of the Philistines, that he killed 1,000 Philistines using the jawbone of a donkey, which is weird, that he carried uh, the, gate, uh, the city gate up a mountain. And on another occasion, it says that he killed 3,000 Philistines at one, at one time. Samson's strength was impressive, but his life really was not. Samson was driven by selfishness, lust, and revenge. He was unteachable and arrogant. In fact, almost everything that was amazing, almost every amazing act that Samson did was driven by lust, revenge, or pride. And so we're going to look at a couple of things that we just mentioned when I said he did some amazing things, and we're going to talk about really what was underneath some of those things. For, for instance, when it talked about how Samson killed 30 Philistines at one time, interesting story. You can find it in, in chapter 14, verses 1 through 19. But it says that Samson saw a Philistine woman who is right in his own eyes. And he married her against the will of his parents. And at the wedding, or after the wedding, he made this foolish bet with some of the guys that were at the wedding. And then those guys got uh, his wife to tell them what the answer to the riddle was. And so in order for Samson to pay back the bet, he went out and killed 30 people, took their clothes, and use that to pay back the people for the silly bet that he made. Which would be bad enough if it stopped there. But it doesn't. It says that he got so mad at his wife, he blamed the whole thing on his wife. And then he went crying home to his mom and dad. So he like left his wife the day of their wedding is what it sounds like when you read it. He got so mad that, that she gave away the riddle that he really, he, he said basically enough with you, I'm going back home with my mom and dad. And, and then he left. That's That's weird. On the occasion where he caught um, 300 foxes, that's in uh, chapter 15, verse 4, it says that later on Samson was missing this wife that he kind of deserted. Fellas, take some notes because he does make one good move right here. So he's missing this wife that he abandoned and so he brought her a goat. <laughs> Nothing says, honey, I'm sorry. Can we get back together like a goat? And with Christmas just right around the corner, men, I got a goat guy. <laughs> Seriously, I'm kind of looking for a goat now. That would be funny. <laughs> but he finds out that, you know, so he comes back to bring his wife a goat. And he finds out that his father-in-law had just really thought that Samson had moved on. And so he gave his wife to his best man. And so Samson, out of revenge, caught 300 foxes, tied their tails together, attached a torch, and set the foxes loose into the field and just burnt the crops of the Philistines. 
And so in revenge to that, the Philistines got Samson's father-in-law and wife and burnt them at the stake. And then in revenge to that, it says that Samson went out of the Philistines with great fury. And then he went into hiding. The Philistines were so tired of it that they sat out, uh, set up camp outside of Judah and they were getting ready to, to go to war with Judah. Again, this to me is a really telling part of the story. Because instead of going to war, Judah was more than happy to hand over the one that was supposed to deliver them to the Philistines. There's your guy, you know, like the one that's supposed to lead. They turned him over to the Philistines. And it says that, that he broke loose and that he killed 1,000 Philistine, Philistines using the jawbone of a donkey. And later on, we, we see uh, Samson visit a prostitute, and then after that, he falls in love with another Philistine woman named Delilah, and she betrayed him, and she accepted a bribe uh, to find out what the source of strength was, and after lying several times, eventually Samson gives in, tells her that the source of strength is his hair. Samson gave in, and he broke the very last part of the vow. As Delilah called somebody in to shave Samson's head, and it says that his strength was gone. And in the midst of that, there's a verse that I want to read for you. It's uh, ch- uh, chapter 16, verse 20, that I think is, is, is important. It says that, Then she, Delilah, cried out, Samson, the Philistines have come to capture you. And when he woke up, he thought, I will do as I have done before. I'll shake myself free. But he did not realize that the Lord had left him. The source of Samson's strength was not his hair. He realized that the Lord had left him. In Judges, God's presence meant victory, but God's presence didn't seem to mean very much to Samson at all. And finally, God allowed Samson's choices to be his undoing. They gouged out his eyes and they they tied him and they made him grind grain. And then Judges 16, 23, 30, this is how the story ends. It says the Philistine rulers held a great festival, offering sacrifices and praising their god, Dagon. And they said, our God has given us victory over our enemy, Samson. And when the people saw him, they praised their God, saying, our God has delivered our enemy to us. The one who killed so many of us is now in our power. And half drunk by now, they demanded, bring out Samson so that he can amuse us. And so they brought, they brought from the prison, they, so, he, <laughs> so he, brought, he was brought from the prison to amuse them. And they had him stand between the pillars that supported the roof. And Samson said to the young servant who was leading him by the hand, place my hand against the pillars that hold up the temple. I want to rest against them. Now the temple was completely filled with people. All the Philistine rulers were there. And there were about 3,000 men and women on the roof who were watching as Samson amused them. And then Samson prayed to the Lord. Sovereign Lord, remember me again. Oh God, please strengthen me just one more time. With one blow, let me pay back the Philistines for the loss of my two eyes. And then Samson put his hand on the the center pillars of the temple, pushing against them with both hands, and he prayed, let me die with the Philistines. And the, the temple crashed down on the Philistine rulers and on all the people. And so he killed more people when he did when he died than when he uh, than during the, his entire life. And I don't know if you heard it, but I did. In all four chapters, when we hear Samson's story, he only cries out to God one other time. It's in chapter 15. Uh, I think it's verse 18. And if you read the prayer that Samson gives there, it's very different. He kind of gives thanks to God for the victory, but then he says something like this. He says something like, God, thanks for the victory that you did through my strength. And then when you fast forward to the prayer that we just heard, do you hear the difference? Yeah, he's still out for revenge. But he understands where his power comes from. He understands the source of it. Samson accomplished more in his death than he ever did in his life. His life was all about what he wanted, showing very, very little concern about those around him for the vow, for the special relationship that he was to have with God. And unfortunately, we learned far more about what not to do from Samson, from this leader of God's people. Because of the vow, he may have looked the part, and he certainly had all the tools, but sin, selfishness, lust, pride, arrogance led to a mess. And Samson did what was right in his own eyes. He chased things, all kinds of things that took him away from 
what God would want for him. And in the end, Samson was a broken and blinded man. Here comes another profound statement. Are you ready for it? This is the major lesson I think that we get from Samson's story. Don't be like Samson. Don't be like Samson. Don't allow our lives to be driven by things that take us away from what God desires for us, which as our creator, his desire for us, what he created us for, is so much better than anything that we can experience when we live for what's right in our own eyes. We are all broken. We're all broken. And there's kind of a weird piece about that to me at least. That your stuff and my stuff, I mean really when you come down to it, is really not all that different. We're all broken. But what do we do about it? You know, when we look at Samson's story, we learn all kinds of crazy cool things about God. We learn that God takes sin seriously and that we should too. We learn that God will will still put us in situations that, that are intended to draw us back to him because he loves us so much. We learn that God is incredibly faithful even when we are not. We learn that God is committed to his people and that he's committed to what he said he would do. And so today I'm going to ask the worship team to come back. And I want us to, to do a little bit of introspection, to look just a little bit. Are we living like sin in the Pharisees? Are we ignoring the special relationship and purpose that we have in God that, that's been given to us through Jesus? Is our life and our, and our legacy more defined by sin or by his presence? Have we become comfortable living in the captivity of sin, addiction, pride, anger, greed, porn, and so on? And today I've asked them to, to sing a closing song and, and there's just a couple things I want you to think about. First of all, you, you don't have to do anything, which is great. But I want to give you guys an opportunity to, to just kind of have a conversation with God. And you can do that right where you're sitting or as they sing. If you want to come forward and pray to God at the steps, you're welcome to. And if you want to pray with me, I, I would love that. I would love to pray with you. And you can be as candid or as uncandid as you want to be. It's, it's, it's really about the conversation between you and the Lord. But maybe repentance is something that would be good for us to consider today. Just to throw it out there before God and say, you know, God, I really want to have everything. I want to experience everything that it is that you have for me. And I don't want those things that get in the way, that do damage and that are corrosive in my life. I don't want to, to be a part of those things. And so I need your help. I need your help and courage and strength. And so as we sing, if that's something you want to do, you can stay right you're at and pray, pray to God or you can come forward and pray or, or you can come and pray with me. So let's pray and then we'll sing. And if, if that sounds great to you, then, then I'd ask you to consider doing that. God, I just want to say thank you for the lessons that you teach us. Lessons like, don't be like Samson. God, that you give us examples of, of those kinds of things that cause damage in our life and, and, you, and you, you help us lead, lead us out of that. And so God, I pray that you'd help us to be people that are more defined by your presence than by sin. People who are more defined by serving others and loving well and forgiving God, help us to be like that. I pray that in Jesus' name. Amen. Would you stand and sing with us, please?